And now a reading from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. It's on page 3 in the New Testament if you'd like to follow along. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me, please. Gracious God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this privilege that it is to be gathered here and to stand here in this place with this people. And I pray that you remind all of us that wherever we are, we stand in your holy presence. And so may our words and our actions, our thoughts, our intentions, and our attentions of this day be directed to your greater glory. Amen. We're going to be spending quite a bit of time in 2014 with the Gospel of Matthew. And one of the goals that I have for us is that through the Gospel of Matthew and over the course of this year, we get to know Jesus a whole lot better that we get to know his context better and the life he lived better and his teachings and his message to us better. So each week when we come together here on Sunday morning for worship during the sermon, I'll be focusing on one particular aspect of his life and then emphasizing something that we can learn from that about ourselves, about God, about what it means to be his followers and to be his people. Now, we'll continue this at least through Easter and see where we are this first part of the year. And as you can imagine, any given Sunday, there's going to be much more that we could say about that topic than we could fit into a sermon. And so, if you want to refer to this yellow insert, you can. Each week, there'll be a yellow insert like this, a four four page or, or uh, fourfold, and it will have extra information that we just can't include in the sermon, but, but uh, stuff that I think is helpful for all of us. And so when you come into worship and you're gathering your heart and, and mind for, for worship as worship is getting ready to start, you can read through these things. Uh, there's a sermon outline for the words I'm going to say today. There's a map on the back today. You can take it home, and if this helps you uh, as you think about the word throughout the week, then, then that's wonderful because our goal is that we grow. We grow each and every time we come to worship, each and every time we open the Bible, that we grow a little bit more in our knowledge and understanding of this faith that we profess. So we start today, and our focus is the baptism of Jesus the baptism of Jesus. And we start to get into that topic. We start by looking at this map, if you would. And this is the land in which Jesus lived. We know, we just celebrated Christmas, so we know that he was born in a city in the south called Bethlehem. And that's circled there for you on the map. But his hometown was really in the north. It was Nazareth. That's where Mary and Joseph were from. That's where Joseph had his carpentry shop. That's where the angel Gabriel came to to Mary and said, Do not be afraid. You will conceive and and bear uh, Jesus, the Messiah. That all happened in Nazareth. We remember that the only reason why Jesus was born in Bethlehem was because Mary and Joseph traveled down south to respond to the census that was required. And there uh, was where Jesus was born. But his hometown is really Nazareth. That's his his milieu. And one of the things that we notice when we open the Bible and we start reading about Jesus' life is that he goes from being a little baby one day 
to being a grown man of 30 the next. <laughs> Quite literally, Matthew chapter 2, and if you, uh, we didn't meet last week, but I had a sermon prepared to give last Sunday. Um, but last Sunday's sermon would have focused on the wise men coming to the manger. That's Matthew chapter 2. He's an infant. Literally turning the page to Matthew chapter 3, we find he's already 30 years old. What do we make of that? Well, he didn't grow that fast, for one. Really, the, the Bible focuses, the Gospels focus much of their attention on his ministry. The years from when he was 30 to 33. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, there's just two chapters that are devoted to his birth. And then 26 chapters devoted to ages 30 to 33. And we have to infer from that that ministry matters most in Jesus' life. The ministry of Jesus matters the most. Otherwise, we would have been given all kinds of information about the preteen, teen, and, and young adult Jesus. Ministry matters most. And that ministry, if you refer to your map, was really done in an area called Galilee. Galilee. And Galilee, you can see on the map, is a wider region in which Nazareth is located. So this is the territory where Jesus preached and taught and did many, many miracles. Now, did he leave Galilee? Yes, occasionally he did. But here's what's interesting. When he left Galilee, he either went north to Phoenicia, northeast to Galanitis, or east to the Decapolis, or south just to Samaria. And what's noteworthy about all those four places? They were considered heathen territory. Good, self-respecting Jews like Jesus would have looked down on those people because they were inferior. They were non-Jews. But notice, Jesus spends a lot of his ministry going directly and intentionally into those inferior, so to speak, places. And so we, we know that a core component of his ministry is going to be to break down barriers and to cross over boundaries and include people in God's kingdom and not exclude them. And then we know he starts his ministry at age 30. He, he, he undertakes this ministry for three years. And we know at age 33... He walks the way down to Jerusalem, again on your map, in the south. He walks that way to Jerusalem with his disciples. They go through Samaria, all the way down to the capital city, Jerusalem. They celebrate the Jewish festival Passover there, and that's where he's killed. Now, we'll get to that later in the year. But notice, his whole ministry is about breaking down barriers and, and crossing over boundaries. And what does he do in Jerusalem at the very end? The ultimate breaking down of a barrier in his death and resurrection eliminates that boundary from our lives. Like I said, we'll get there later in the year. This is only January, right? But our focus today is the baptism. The baptism of Jesus. And we heard that read for us today from Hannah. Jesus... Uh, at age 30, comes from Nazareth in Galilee, Matthew says, to his cousin John and is baptized in the Jordan River. And that's the river on your map that runs straight down the middle. Straight down the middle, in the Jordan River. And the first thing that's really compelling about Jesus' baptism is this. Notice that it happens in chapter 3. And we just said that everything, his whole ministry, is from chapter 3 to chapter 28. And so that tells us that his baptism happens at the beginning of his ministry and not at the end. The baptism of Jesus occurs at the start of the journey and not at the end of the journey. In other words, you see, baptism is not a lifetime achievement award. <laughs> Baptism is not what we receive after we've gone to worship 10,000 times or after we've done these certain things and checked these things off our list. Now we have achieved the pinnacle and can be baptized. No, it's very telling. Baptism is done at the start of the journey. So we don't need to accomplish anything. What that tells me 
for us as believers is that we don't have to have full knowledge of Christ to follow him. We don't have to have complete and total understanding of God's will and purpose in order to follow Christ. We don't have to have perfect capability to fulfill the expectations to follow. We need faith. That's it. And in, in, in time, on that journey, we grow in our knowledge and our understanding and our ability. But those are not prerequisites to be baptized. Many times I'll hear people who are 30 and 40 and 50, generally not 60, 70, and 80, but 30s, 40s, and 50-year-olds will periodically tell me, I want to get baptized again. I say, Why? They say, well, when I was baptized either as a baby, which I don't remember, or as an 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12-year-old, my, my baptism didn't mean then what it would mean to me now. My faith is so much more mature. My perspective is so much broader. That, and I've grown so much in my faith that I want to acknowledge that. And I feel like if I was baptized again, it would be that much more significant. And I say, that's wonderful that you're growing in your faith. We all would only hope to grow in our maturity and our perspective as we go through life. But that doesn't mean we need to be baptized again. Because baptism is not something we do or we decide for, for ourselves that we do again and again every time we climb a, a, a rung on the spiritual ladder. Baptism is a commitment that we make to God and it's a commitment that God makes to us. It's a commitment that we say, God, we are committing this walk ahead of us to you. And God says, I'm committing that right back with you. And you'll never walk alone. And you see, that's really of necessity at the start of the journey. At the start of the journey. So we're getting ready to, to baptize some young people uh, at Easter this year. And that's one of the things we tell them. You don't have to have perfect understanding or knowledge in order to take this step. You grow in this step, but this is the commitment that God makes to walk with you and that you make to God. But what I'd like to focus on in the time that we have left are really these important words that God says to Jesus in his baptism. Now, sometimes we'll refer to the, the Greek language, this ancient Greek language, and the reason why we do that is the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. So sometimes we look at the, the definition of Greek words because they can shed insight onto what this original word was that was handed down to us. And we, we look at, at Jesus is coming up out of the water and the voice from heaven says what? This is my son, the what? This is my son, the beloved, right. This is my son, the beloved. And the, what's, what's really noteworthy about this is this Greek word, beloved, is probably a word that you're familiar with. It's a word used by Jesus and about Jesus quite a bit. It's this, agape. Have you heard that? Agape. Or it's the past participular form of agape, agapeso. But what it, so this line says, this is my son, the agape. This is my son, the agape. And what does agape mean? It means the one who is worthy of love, or it can mean the one that I am content with. So translating that then, it would say, this is my son who is worthy of my love, or this is my son with whom I am content now, here's what I find incredibly fascinating about that. Jesus is worthy of the love of God, and God is content and satisfied with him before he does anything. Before he does anything. The baptism comes before he's done his ministry. Before he's, in other words, he's not accepted by God. He's not worthy in God's eyes. He's not loved by God because he's walked on water or raised the dead or fed the thousands or touched the lepers or welcomed the outcast. He's loved. He is the beloved simply because God chooses to see him that way. And so that worth, his worthiness comes from within. It doesn't come from without. It doesn't come from some external standard that says if you climb these rungs, then you're worthy. It's not as though Jesus was worthy because he fed 5,000, but if he only got to 3,500 on that day, he was not worthy. 
No, his worth came from this sense from within, from these words that God planted in him. You are my son, the beloved, worthy of my love, because I say that's true. It's my choice to see you that way. And I think about that. I think about this word beloved and compared with the word love. I think about our lives, and I wonder, I wonder, from a spiritual standpoint, if there's not a difference between beloved and being loved. That's what I mean. Being loved, I wonder if it's not something that's just what we humans deal with on this earthly realm. That it's good and it's valuable, but in some ways it's always limited because it's always conditional. Follow me for a minute. We experience being loved because of something, either because we're related and we belong to each other bloodwise, or we uh, experience love because we're connected in another way. I am loved by you because I am your pastor and you experience love from me because of this connection of the people in the church that I serve. Some connection that way. Or we experience love because we possess some gift that when we share with someone it benefits their lives and, and makes them, uh, th th them grow. But if any of those things are not there, we don't experience that same love, either giving it or receiving it. And so, in other words, with love, there, there's, I wonder if there's not always a because that's necessary. And it's always implicit in the way we use that word. Even parents, we say that we love our children and grandparents. We love our children and grandchildren unconditionally. And maybe it's easier for, for grandparents to say that than parents. I don't know. But we say we love, we want, we want to aspire to loving our children unconditionally, right? We say that. But I wonder if not, if, if, if embedded in that is already the fact that the child has met the condition of belonging to the parent. And we love our children because they belong to us. And the reason why we can say I love you unconditionally is only because you already belong to me. In that I don't love all children unconditionally, but I love those that belong to me unconditionally. But with belovedness, with belovedness, there's no because that's required. This is God's love that transcends the best of our human efforts. This is the love with which God loves that has no because. It's, it's, it's a just because love. I don't love you because you've done these things, because of this, that, or the other, because of what you have or don't have. I love you just because. Just because. I think about this in my life. Think about if Think about love and belovedness in this way. And I intentionally entitled the sermon this way, Why I Don't Want to Be Loved. I don't know when you read that, if you felt that was controversial or provocative. It was intended to be that way. What I mean by that is, if love is conditional at some level, that it's always conditional, then I don't know that I can handle that. Because I may not, all, I may not meet the expectations of receiving that love. If love, in other words, is received, if being loved is dependent upon belonging, then what happens if the ones I belong to die? Or what happens if I'm not near the ones I belong to and there's nobody around me that knows me? Or if being loved needs me sharing my God-given gifts in the service of others, what happens on those days when I do that poorly or don't do that at all because of my human brokenness? Or what happens if, if my worth is dependent upon somebody else's standards of, of accomplishment? Like I was saying today at 8 o'clock, if being loved is the equivalent of being able to run a 5-minute and 30-second mile, I, I, can, I can try again and again and again and again and never meet that expectation. But to be God's beloved is to know that no matter what the status of my life may be, no matter how much my faults trump my giftedness and make life miserable for others, even in spite of my, of my best efforts to the contrary, to know that somebody, God, still is content with me and that I still matter, I'll take that any day. I'll take that any day. Because I want to be loved by my mom. And I want to be loved by my wife and my children. And I want you to love me. 
but I desperately need to be God's beloved, to know that no matter what, just because, because God chooses to see me that way, I'm blessed. And the beautiful thing is, is what we tell the kids in bap- when they'll be baptized, in baptism, God speaks those words to us. God says at the start of your journey and every step along the way, when you commit, God says, you're my daughter and you're my son, the beloved, and I choose to love you just because. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you. I thank you for giving us your belovedness and for accepting and loving us just because. And may that be our source of strength, this knowledge and and understanding of our worth in your eyes every step of our journey. Amen.